When we began this series on the book of Job in the Bible, we knew already that many people this year have been going through times that are really tough and very, very difficult. But we had no idea that such sadnesses would hit our own circle of friends and our extended family in the way that they have over these past days and weeks. And our thoughts and our prayers are for them and with them. Our hearts weep with them. I don't believe it's just a coincidence that we've begun this series of messages. I believe that God was directing us to this part of scripture for a reason. Because Job, who lived so long ago in the very early days of the Bible, was someone also who knew great, great sadness and loss and heartache in his own personal life. When things seemed to be going so well for him, he was well off, successful in business, a happy family man, respected in his community, suddenly troubles hit him, one after the other, like waves of the sea, knocking him over repeatedly before he could even get up again. He was a righteous man, and righteous people are not immune from tragedy and sadness. We might ask, why does it happen to good people? But only in these last few days we've heard the tragic story of a lovely family, a Christian family, a family that were inspirational and helpful in their outreach to other people. And in a tragic car accident in Oxfordshire, four members of that family of six were suddenly taken. This is the reality of living in a world like this, a fallen world, a world that is broken and messed up because human beings have turned their backs upon God. But Job had to face these realities, the normal experience of suffering in the midst of joy as well and, and happier experiences in life. But first enemies came and they killed some of his servants. They stole away his oxen and donkeys. Then a firestorm from heaven burned up a flock of sheep and his shepherds. And then another hostile tribe stole camels and struck down more of his men. And each time someone came to tell him of the awful thing that had happened, before he'd even finished speaking, another messenger came with even more terrible bad news. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, and that's the repeated refrain. And then each time a servant came, he finished by saying, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And it just underlines the relentlessness of the pain and sorrow. One hammer blow came after another, and then the most horrendously shattering event of all, Job's seven sons and three daughters were all together celebrating and feasting in the elder brother's house. And a cyclone smashed the building to pieces and they were killed instantly. When such events strike, when the whirlwind hits your house, metaphorically if not literally, the question that might be asked, perhaps understandably, is where is God? It's the question that John Blanchard asks on the cover of his booklet, where is God when things go wrong? And he begins with the true story of an American teenage girl, as she was then, by the name of Joni Erickson. Life could hardly have been better for the beautiful American teenager as she prepared to dive into the sparkling waters of Chesapeake Bay. She had a happy life, brought up in a secure and loving Christian home. As far as she could see that day, the world could not be brighter. There was a glorious sunset in the sky at the end of that hot day in July. She looked at the sparkling surface of the water. She flexed her sun-tanned arms and legs and dived in. Five seconds later, her life had changed forever. As she turned back towards the surface, 
Her head struck a rock, trapping her on the sandy floor of the bay. She felt a terrible sensation, like an electric shock right through her body. She had no control anymore over her arms and legs. She was paralysed. Her sister managed to rescue her from the water and she was soon rushed to hospital by ambulance. After several tests and x-rays and emergency surgery, once she'd regained consciousness, the doctors had to break that devastating news to her. Yes, the injury to her spinal cord meant that she would never again be able to use her arms or hands or legs. Oh God, she cried, how can you do this to me? What have you done to me? What's the use of believing when your prayers fall on deaf ears? God doesn't care. He doesn't even care. It's natural to question, where is God? When painful experiences hit us hard, where is God? Is he there? Does he even exist? If he does, can he do anything to help me? Does he care? And when I'm all alone, when people misunderstand me and wrongly judge me perhaps, will anyone speak up for me? Will he? In Job chapter 1 verses 6 to 12, we're given a glimpse behind the scenes, behind the curtain, of this real life drama. Today, just for a while, we're going backstage and we're privileged to be let into the secret of what was really happening in that unseen realm and to see things now from a different angle. We're allowed to see what Job himself does not see. He's still struggling in the dark, but we're able to see more than he is able to see. This interaction between God and Satan. Job had many, many questions. We're going to ask three today. The first one is who? Who has done this to me? Who is responsible for Job's sufferings? Job himself? Is it his fault? Is this a judgment of God? No, that's what his friends said but their theory was shown to be false. It was not about Job's own personal sin. That wasn't why this was happening. Was it other human beings then that were to blame? To some extent, yes. The Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, these enemy tribes had come along and they'd done their worst. But then there were also disasters in the natural world with no human involvement, this firestorm. And then what about the evil one? What about Satan? Did he have a part to play in this? Well, we have to see it on one level as a direct attack of the evil one. In verse six, it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. And in verse 11, Satan said to God, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that Job has and he will surely curse you to your face. Yes, the devil was actively working against Job and he's actively working in this world against God and against his people. Yes, he will try to keep you from following the right paths, but he can only do what God allows him. God puts limits on what Satan could do to Job. In verse 12, the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So there's a limit there to what Satan's able to do. And then later in chapter two, verse six, the Lord allows Satan to go even further than that. Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. In John Bunyan's famous old story, Pilgrim's Progress, at one point on Christian's journey, he has to pass between two lions, one on each side of the path. And as he gets near to that point, the lions roar and he's terrified. 
But then a voice calls to him, don't fear the lions, for they are chained and they are placed there to test your faith. Keep to the middle of the path and no harm will come to you. Satan is like those lions, very powerful, very dangerous, seeking to do harm. But remember, he is restrained by a strong chain. God is in control, not him. He can roar and he can do damage in a limited area, but only as far as the chain will allow. Only as far as God will allow. God, not Satan, is in control. We don't hear of Satan again after chapter 2, throughout the whole of the rest of that book. If we really believe in the sovereignty of God, that he governs everything that happens, we have to say that Job's painful experiences were planned and purposed by God. Can you see that? We might not understand those purposes, but we have to reckon with that fact that if he is in control of all things, these events also must have been part of his plan. God was in this. There's a divine purpose. Who started this conversation in the spiritual realm? Was it Satan or God? In verse 7, it was God, actually. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Who made the first move? Who brought Job into this? Not Satan, but God. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. It might not be comfortable for, for us to hear and to reckon with this, but God has a plan even in the most terrible and tragic circumstances. God is not the author of sin. He has no part himself in sinful actions. He is not the direct cause of evil. And yet, in his sovereignty, he allows evil things and wicked people to take their own course, the course that they themselves are already intent upon following. And he even works that into his purposes. J.I. Packer illustrates it in this way. A man might keep a vicious dog to guard his house. If a burglar should break in, what does the man do? He lets the dog loose. In achieving something positive, the protection of his house, he lets something harmful take its course, its natural course. God sometimes allows Satan and evil people to do their worst in order to achieve a positive outcome in the end. In our immediate situation, we might not be able to see any positive, but in the end, looking at the whole scheme of things, God is working together all things for the good of his people and the glory of his name. So let's ask, what is that purpose? What is that positive purpose? Our second question then is why? Why are these awful things happening? Do you doubt that there could be a positive purpose in suffering? It's understandable to doubt that when you're going through it. Do you doubt that it could possibly achieve anything good at all? That suffering could ever form a part of God's plan? Do you doubt that? As we explore these questions, let me take you to one of the darkest days in history, to one of the darkest places, Calvary's Cross. See there the great example of human suffering, the greatest example ever. Can you think of any worse evil than this? That people should take an innocent man and falsely accuse him and condemn him and cruelly treat him and make him suffer and die in the most barbaric way. 
And yet, can you think of any event that has brought about greater good? Salvation for millions from sin and death, changed lives forever, sometimes changed societies, transformed by the work of the gospel. The Apostle Peter said in Acts 2 verse 23, him, that is Jesus, being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. The determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. Do you see that? God was in this. God had a purpose, a good purpose in the end. Salvation, everlasting life. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. You have done this, he said. Human beings were responsible. Yes, God is sovereign. He is above all and in full command of every, everything that happens. But man is responsible. Both are true. God planned it, but human beings actually carried out the evil deeds. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility are truths that are taught clearly in the Bible and both have to be held in balance. You're not asked to fully understand it. You're not asked to work it all out in your own mind. We can't. But to accept that this is so. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up. You see, nothing could stop God's purposes, his saving purposes from being fulfilled. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Only because of that does it then say, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, in verse 12. What was the purpose of suffering in Job's particular case? Was it to teach him patience? In James chapter 5, verse 11, it speaks of the patience of Job. You have heard of the patience of Job. But perhaps a better translation of that word is the perseverance or the endurance of Job. When we see Job in all his turmoil of emotions later, we're not particularly struck by his patience. In all the ups and downs of that roller coaster of emotion, he made it by the grace of God. To the end. His faith survived intact. And one aim of the book of Job is to show the grace of God in his life through the fact that he continued to trust God against all the odds. And to show compassion as well and the mercy of God towards him. In the end he restored more than had been lost at the beginning. But it's not just about what happened to Job as an individual, as we've said before. Something greater than that was going on, is to glorify God, is to prove that God was right all along. What is the answer to Satan's taunt in verse nine? He had said, does Job fear God for nothing? What's the answer? The answer is yes, as Bill Cotton points out in his commentary on Job, yes, Job fears God for nothing. He expects nothing in return. He deserves nothing. He believes in God because it is right to do so. Because he can do nothing else. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. He says in chapter 13, verse 15. Whatever happens to him, nothing will change the fact that God is and it's the most sensible thing in the world to trust him. Even in the worst situations, to trust him. 
Was Job being punished because he was a terrible sinner, as his friends thought? No, on the contrary, he's facing these troubles precisely because he's a righteous man. Verse 8, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. The Reformation Bible says Job suffered not because he was one of the worst of men, but because he was one of the best of men. His ordeal glorified God. If you suffer as a Christian, God's purpose is not only to teach you something, though that may happen, but is to accomplish something on an even bigger scale, is to show the world what real faith looks like, so it may shine as pure gold shines when it's been through the fire of testing. And that brings us to consider the third question before us today. How? How should I respond to this? It's normal to have troubles. It's normal for Christians to have troubles. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God, said Paul in Acts 14, 22. Expect problems, expect disappointments, expect painful trials. It's part of what is called the fellowship of Christ's sufferings in Philippians chapter 3. Do you realise being united to Christ necessarily means sharing in his sufferings? God's plan is that the glory of heaven is only reached through the pathway of suffering. That was so for Jesus himself, and it is so for those who follow him. It was God's plan, even for his son, it was necessary that he should suffer. Mark 8 and verse 31 tells us that Jesus began to teach them, he began to teach his disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. The Son of Man must suffer, explained Jesus. How else do you think that your sins could be forgiven? Who could pay the price? Only the Lord Jesus Christ, only the Son of God could do this. And it's only by enduring the suffering of the cross and coming through that to resurrection that he would win the victory for all of us who will follow him. God does have a purpose in suffering. We said last time we may not always understand his providences, but we can learn to trust him. We began today with the story of Joni Erickson, the teenager who became paralysed and was to spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair with no use of her arms and legs. She was filled with bitterness and she blamed God. But the story doesn't end there. Two years after she broke her neck, she began to emerge out of the most severe depression that had gripped her and in her helplessness and her confusion to begin to turn to God again. And her faith grew and she began to see things differently. She learned to paint amazingly beautiful pictures holding a paintbrush between her teeth. She started a radio programme to give encouraging words to many others. She went on to found a charity that would provide wheelchairs for thousands of people throughout the world. And she wrote books that have spoken words of true hope from her own experience, her real experience of suffering, and have spoken hope to numerous people. Some years on from that awful life-changing day, as she reflected on what had happened to her, she wrote this. My accident was not a punishment for my wrongdoing, whether or not I deserved it. Only God knows why I was paralysed. Maybe he knew I'd ultimately be happier serving him. If I were still on my feet, 
it's hard to say how things might have gone. I probably would have drifted through life, marriage, maybe even divorce, dissatisfied and disillusioned. I'm really thankful he did something to get my attention and change me. Today, as I look back, I'm convinced that the whole ordeal of my paralysis was inspired by God's love. I wasn't the brunt of some cruel divine joke. God had reasons behind my suffering and learning some of them has made all the difference in the world. That's how she responded to the difficult events that had taken place in her life. What about you? How will you respond to the tough experiences you will face or perhaps are facing even now? God's ways are often confusing but always in the end good. We may not see that at the time but it's true. Will you turn to him even when you're hurting? especially when you're hurting. Will you cast your cares upon him, knowing that he cares for you?